From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here, and coming up today, K-State's Kurt Thompson will explain why the rainfall over the last few days has created an excellent opportunity, he says, to treat crop fields for two notorious weed problems, burr ragweed and field bindweed. He'll go over the preferred herbicide options for controlling each with a fall treatment. Also today, K-State's Robin Reed will talk about budgeting stalker and backgrounder calf programs, calculating the likely returns to those programs heading into 2018. She presented this information at the Beef Stalker Field Day here at K-State last week. And K-State's Charlie Lee talks about the least shrew, which many people mistake for a mole when they find one in their homes. All this plus more next on Agriculture Today. With the shortage of primary care physicians, especially in rural areas, health education and disease prevention are vital. K-State Research and Extension programs address quality of life, personal development, and health behaviors across all life stages of all social economic groups. To learn more about health education, one of K-State Research and Extension's five grand challenges, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. We're going to take up on the first part of the broadcast a couple of the more problematic weed issues we find in Kansas crop production with the idea that fall may be an optimum time for treating those weeds. We're talking once again with weed management specialist, K-State Research and Extension, Kurt Thompson. By name, Kurt, burr ragweed and field bindweed. We'll get into those separately, but you think to set the table here, that there may be an accelerated chance to control these because of the recent moisture around Kansas. Yeah, what's just happened this past weekend and and maybe still coming, uh, this good moisture really does make these perennial weeds actively putting carbohydrate down into their root systems. And so it's just an excellent time to uh, send a little herbicide with that the opposite of that is if we were dry, then we might stick with just a 2,4-D or, or glyphosate, something real cheap. But this is a good chance or a good opportunity to control these two weeds at this point. So taking advantage of the good fortune here, burr ragweed, why it's such a challenge to bring it in check? It's been around for a while. It's a noxious weed, as we know. You know, it's been around for a long time. And and 20 years ago, when we first put together a publication on burr ragweed, I think we had about 93,000 acres in the western half of the state. And we're still sitting at about 94,000 acres in the western half of the state. And so that does suggest that it is difficult to control. Uh, What's unique about burr ragweed is, and it's also called woolly leaf burr sage. It's also called silver lake weed. But it is that bluish gray weed we see growing in low areas in fields out west. And being that perennial, using a lot of moisture, really our yield potential in those areas is very low. Uh, We have a chance to grow wheat if we happen to have good fall and, and winter moisture. But trying to grow a summer crop in a patch of burr ragweed is just about impossible and often yields are zero. Hmm. The other problem that we have is you'll plant a summer row crop, you'll get a heavy rainfall, the water will pool, destroy the row crop, and then the burr ragweed just has a great time. And so we have been fairly dry. These low areas have dried up. Now we're getting some significant moisture. Assuming that moisture will disappear and prior to freeze up, coming through with some type of chemical treatment can do a great job on burr ragweed. And as you hinted earlier, because the burr ragweed is in good vigor now, thanks to the recent moisture, one's control options are widened that much more, right? Uh, They are. And I think if we can spray them, Prior to freeze up, because we have to have that plant able to take up the herbicide. And to be honest with you, the most consistent treatment that we have on burr ragweed is an herbicide that contains Tordon or 
picloram is is the active ingredient. So any herbicide that that contains picloram uh, would be a good choice. Uh, you can add to that some 2,4-D or dicamba. All of those can help control the burr ragweed. Uh, we have also evaluated things like glyphosate 2,4-D. We have had some respectable control with that, but it's not consistent. In a second year, did very poor, and so really the most consistent chemical that gives us the longest period of control is Tordon. You say, well, Tordon's going to carry over on my crop. Right, spring crops. That is. On the spring crop. That is correct. But you aren't going to grow any spring crop in the burr ragweed patch anyway. So, you know, let's send some uh, Tordon with it this fall into that root system, and maybe we can reduce some of those acres of burr ragweed out in western Kansas. Would it be practical to think about planting winter wheat following uh, treatment such as Tordon yet this fall? Well, we you could, but even uh, wheat can be adversely affected. If you're using a pine of Tordon, it may have some adverse effect on wheat. Uh, what wheat would do, if you did have any surviving wheat, would be to provide just some cover, some plant growth, which could be detrimental to the burr ragweed come next spring. Uh, but I would guess the yield on that wheat is going to be adversely affected because of the, the Tordon. And we really do need to have a minimum of a pint of Tordon 22K for good control. So the mindset really for the here and now is to knock out that burr ragweed. That's Think about cropping on down the line quite a ways. Yep, that's correct. And it is going to require more than one treatment. There isn't any single year treatment that is assuring us that we're going to completely take care of the burr ragweed. We just have to hit it hard when we can and conditions are good. Again, burr ragweed is the formidable foe we find mostly in western Kansas. The other weed we'll bring up today is statewide. Field bindweed and virtually all crop producers in this state have encountered bindweed at one point or the other. Uh, That's exactly right, Eric. And field bindweed, different from burr ragweed, I said burr ragweed was contained in low areas. Field bindweed will grow anywhere. It is a a real troublesome weed. Again, that deep-rooted perennial fall application is an excellent time to control bindweed. It does lay right down on that soil surface. It will remain green even after like a 32 or 31 degree freeze. If you've got green leaf tissue, we can still spray it. Unlike baragweed, I think we have a few more options that can provide very good control. Tordon is still another uh, excellent choice. But your comment about planting wheat back... There is an herbicide out there that has probably been the next best herbicide to Tordon for controlling bindweed is Facet L. Used to be uh, Paramount, okay? And uh, Facet, the active ingredient, is quinclorac. Using the maximum rate post-emergence on bindweed, uh, you do need an adjuvant system with it. We've seen some very good control in the fall and you have safety to come back and plant wheat. And so if you're, you're getting rain today, and as soon as it gets dry enough, if you've got some bindweed patches out there that you want to spray and then turn around and plant wheat, you can do that safely. Now, if you use Tordon, the same thing applies as, as in the burr ragweed discussion. We will see some adverse effect on wheat with that Tordon carryover. And while we're talking about that quinclorac product, wheat and grain sorghum, no waiting restrictions whatsoever. Anything that, else, there's a longer correct. interval, right? Absolutely. Now, we, we still could come back in if, if you don't want to use Paramount or Tordon. Both of those are a little pricier. You know, using glyphosate Banville, glyphosate 2,4-D can be very effective. At least use those herbicides instead of just tillage 
just sending some herbicide down into that bindweed plant this time of year can be extremely beneficial. There's a real good chance that a single treatment isn't going to take care of the bindweed. Bindweed seed also lays in the soil for up to 30 and 40 years, so we always have to keep coming back and treating, if nothing else, bindweed seedlings. And bindweed seedlings are easy to control. We can do that with any of our dicamba, 2,4-D, glyphosate-type treatments. But the deep-rooted perennial, spending more money using Tordon or a product like Facet, the Quinclorac, uh, can be beneficial and worth their while. And, Kurt, just one quick footnote here. For non-crop land, control of bindweed can be accomplished through other chemistry as well, right? Yeah, there are some other herbicides that can be used in in rangeland. Uh, We actually have a section in our weed guide that specifically address both burr ragweed and field bindweed, and there you could find some pasture herbicides that can be very effective. And this is still a very good time to be spraying rangeland as well for bindweed control and burr ragweed control. Well, you reference it, and that is the 2017 Chemical Weed Control Guide from K-State, which covers all of the options in full detail here. But once more, conditions are such that we do have a good chance of putting a dent in either or both of these weeds, which can be so competitive against our crops in Kansas, field bindweed and burr ragweed. Kurt, we appreciate the word. Thank you. Always a pleasure to be here, Eric. Along with us, Kurt Thompson. He's a weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension. Again, check for that K-State guide, the 2017 version, through your local extension office, or the same information is online at agronomy.ksu.edu. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128-plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today returns now, and we've for you more information that was passed along to the attendees at the 2017 Beef Stalker Field Day hosted by K-State this past Thursday. Of course, it's important to interject some economics into any discussion of making backgrounder and stalker programs work, and our guest did just that at the field day. Robin Reed is an extension associate in agricultural economics at K-State, and you talked with producers, Robin, about budget budgeting for the best economic outcome in raising stockers, raising backgrounders. And you tried to convey several important principles, did you not? Yes, and I know this probably wasn't the most exciting topic when you looked at the lineup, but I would argue with the financial times we're seeing today, the downturn in the farm economy, you know, this is really the, the time to be crunching numbers, no matter what sector of agriculture you're involved in. But I spoke specifically to the stockers and backgrounders at the field day there on this topic. So when you get into budgeting, what are the critical pieces of information that producers need to have on hand? Well, a lot of them they do have on hand. They just don't always evaluate. So I would argue, you know, the first thing to know is what is your cost of production? And we can get into that a little bit later. But Mm -hmm. just by knowing those numbers, you can make some decisions, you know, informed decisions by looking at those. Specifically, you know, if you know what sales price you're targeting, you can look at futures markets, historical basis, knowing your cost of production and that expected sales price, you can make some purchasing decisions on how much you can pay for cattle and still make a profit. One thing a lot of operators will be looking at now is do you background your calves or do you sell them at weaning? You know, this is something that we can evaluate using a budget, knowing our cost of production and the expected sales price of those calves, um, whether you're hedging or using risk management or not, still have an expectation for what you can maybe sell those calves for. And if 
profit potential is there. So that all ties into marketing risk management. Another thing I talked about at the field day is pasture lease rates. Um, when we actually look at the budget here, you'll notice the biggest cost that goes into you know a stocker operation is pasture. And you can shave some dollars off other places, but what you're paying in your lease and what you're stocking at has a huge impact on your cost of production and how profitable you might be. And we know those have kind of ran up in the last mm -hmm. five years, maybe not so much the last two years, but you know, if you can afford that lease or not is definitely something you can evaluate with the budget. We regularly talk about the cost of gain, the value of gain. Those are the numbers you're trying to identify here, right? Yep. So what I did kind of as an example at the field day was to take kind of our five-year average prices for the last five years at our example of early double stock and say, okay, what is the typical value of gain that you can get from this? And then how does that compare to a cost of gain in today's dollars? So I started at $186 per hundred weight, slid down to about $172 per hundred weight. That actually gives us a value of gain with the 1% death loss factored in there of $111. And I think most people would agree $111 of value gain is a pretty good number. Mm -hmm. So if we start there as our income, then we just need to stack that up to our costs. And the lead there is that pasture, you say? Yes. So as economists, we like to break our costs into variable and fixed costs. You can kind of think of variable as what are your cash costs of running those cattle. So as I alluded to in a stocker operation, pasture really trumps most everything. You know, just in the one that I used, we did $25 an acre at about 2.6 acres per animal, per stocker. And that comes out to be $65. Now the other costs we add in there, you know, you have some mineral costs, you have labor, vet medical, drugs, marketing, utilities, machinery, and interest. And so in total, that comes out to be, on my example, about $118. So again, 65 of that can be attributed to pasture. Now, these are not everybody's numbers that I'm looking at here. Right. What I used is a subset of our KFMA database and specifically some operations that did a lot of uh, stock or cattle. So I wouldn't call these benchmarks, but they're definitely in the ballpark of what our producers are facing. One thing I'd want to highlight, labor cost. It's really easy to not count your own labor. You know, you might be paying that high school student or college kid to go out and check your cattle, check your fence once a week or whenever. But your management time is also worth something. So when you're figuring those costs, make sure you put something in there. And not shortchange it to keep it realistic. Yes, yes. It's easy to say this can be your hobby, but... <laughs> In the long run, you do need to make some money at it. So I would definitely put in a cost for your management time in there as well. Where do fixed costs factor in then, Robin? Fixed costs that we kind of look at are depreciation, taxes, insurance, and your opportunity cost. Depreciation is something that I think a lot of people also undervalue. You know, you have equipment that you're using, that pickup truck that you bought, maybe is losing $2,000 a year or so, we'll say, in value. Maybe you're not using it all towards this enterprise, maybe half of that. So let's say $1,000 a year in depreciation just on that one truck. Well, if you only have a small amount of stocker cattle, that fixed cost can really put a big burden on your cost of production. But the more cattle you have and spread that over, obviously that helps. But it's just a cost that you want to make sure you capture because that money has to come from somewhere when you purchase that new truck. So I would definitely say... These fixed costs are something you probably don't always think about but need to be evaluated. Um, the other one is the opportunity cost of investment. Mm -hmm. This is simply if you took the money that you put in this enterprise and invested it elsewhere, what return conservatively could you get on that? And we charge it to the enterprise. So you need to cover this economic cost in the long run for your business to be viable. So you put the obviously the variable costs and the fixed cost together for a total cost number and then compare that to the value of gain, as you mentioned earlier. That's where you come up with a notion of just how profitable this particular enterprise will be. Yep. And when I looked at, you know, our average prices for the last five years, you know, in the last five years at this cost structure, stocker cattle early intensive double stock was pretty profitable. Now 
your operation could be drastically different than the numbers I presented at mm -hmm. Stalker Day. So it is really important. You can go on Ag Manager and find this tool, put in your own numbers, and just see how yours compare. And that is the absolute message here that you want producers to do just that very thing. We'll come back to that in just a second in closing. But you did offer at the Stalker Field Day a look forward as to just what might be happening with calves starting now and going on through the rest of the year, stalkers and backgrounders, and, and whether or not profitability might be at hand. So, yeah, what I did is if you could survive in the last five years and look at a profitable situation, that doesn't always mean going forward that it'll be the same. I used a tool on beefbasis.com. It's the value of gain tool. You can put in information for the Salina market is the one I used, and I put in those same weights, those same dates in 2018 and April to end of July. And what it gives you is a projected buy and sell price per hundred weight for those animals at those weights. When I evaluated it last week, we could maybe buy a 650 pound steer and April for 154 per hundred weight, maybe sell it in July at 143. So this is a value again of almost $98 per hundred weight. If we looked at our cost again, the structure I presented, it's easily below this number, mm -hmm. showing there is definitely some profit potential for next year. But what I said in my presentation is a lot can change between now <laughs> and then. So it definitely not something to take to the bank. But knowing your cost again, looking at these prices, you can definitely start making some plans for next year. And in fact, just briefly, as you calculated backgrounding numbers, basically the same scenario there that there is a potential profit to be had. Yes, I used the same tool and looked at if you bought a 550-pound steer first of November and took it out to, let's say, 775 pounds end of March, not a full backgrounding, but a backgrounding enterprise there, conservative gain of a pound and a half where maybe we're getting those cattle ready to put out on summer grass. But that tool right now was projecting a value of gain of $89 per hundred weight. So depending on your cost structure in the backgrounding enterprise, there could be profit potential there as well. But producers do need to walk through this exercise on their own. And thankfully, there are loads of helpful tools online. And you've mentioned a couple of sites here that producers can lean on and uh, run these calculations on their own. Yes. Yeah, so our website, www.agmanager.info is where we always point people for all of our resources. Specifically, what I'm speaking to are the farm management guides and the livestock budgets. It's an Excel spreadsheet, so you can just take our numbers and override them with your own and develop your own budget pretty easily. The forward-looking margin perspective that I was talking about is the beefbasis.com value gain tool. Again, that's free to use as well, so you can put that information in your budget to evaluate your plans for next year. And there is a link to beefbasis.com on the Ag Manager site. Yes, is not? So yes. You can get all this information off of Ag Manager if you want to go to one place. Tap into that, producers. It's really helpful in walking your way through the budgeting for your stalkers and backgrounders, which was what Robin spoke about at the recent Beef Stalker Field Day here at K-State. Robin, thanks for sharing the information with us. Thank you, Eric. An Extension Associate in Agricultural Economics here at K-State, that's Robin Reed. We'll return with more in a moment on the K-State Radio Network. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Agriculture Today continues now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you as we turn now to today's agricultural news page and these headlines, courtesy in part of DTN. 
And for the Kansas Crop Progress and Condition Report for this week from the USDA, as of this past weekend, topsoil moisture supplies were 58% short to very short and 40% adequate, only 2% surplus. Again, as of this past weekend, subsoil moisture was rated at 53% short to very short, 46% adequate, and 1% surplus. Winter wheat planting in Kansas is 14% in now, emergence of the new crop at 3 percent. The condition of the Kansas corn crop this week, 52 percent, good to excellent, 29 percent fair, and 19 percent poor to very poor. Corn in the dent, 96 percent now. Corn mature at 75 percent, and the corn harvest is 29 percent complete in Kansas. Soybean crop condition this week, 43 percent, good to excellent, and 37 percent fair, 20 percent poor to very poor. Soybeans dropping leaves at 60 percent, and the soybean harvest is 6 percent complete. The condition of the grain sorghum crop then, 58 percent, good to excellent, 32 percent fair, and 10 percent poor to very poor. Sorghum now coloring at 90 percent, and sorghum harvested is at 6 percent. And the fourth cutting of alfalfa, 87 percent complete in the state now, according to the USDA. As for the national corn and soybean harvest numbers and progress report, we turn now to the USDA's Stephanie Ho. The week ending September 24th was a great week for maturing summer crops, although there were still a ways to go. Starting with corn, maturity for the U.S. passed the halfway mark during the week to reach 51 percent by the 24th. Still with the progress, that is behind the five-year average of 64 percent and last year's 70 percent. That was USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey, who says corn maturity jumped more than 20 percentage points in Iowa, Michigan, and Minnesota. Corn harvest, of course, following the uh, slow maturation, is behind schedule. 11 percent complete nationally by the 24th of September. Five-year average is 17 percent. Last year, 14 percent. With corn condition... Locked into place, 61 percent good to excellent... 13% very poor to poor. He says that is significantly lower than the ratings last year. The situation for soybeans is looking a little better than corn in terms of making progress this week. In fact, we saw nationally 22% of the soybeans dropping leaves during the week, and that brought the national number to 63% by September 24th. That is equal to the five-year average. Rippy points to the soy harvest. Well underway in the south and at least starting in the Midwestern states as well. We see 10% nationally harvested, two points behind the five-year average of 12%, but ahead of last year's 9%. He especially pointed to harvest progress in Louisiana and Mississippi. Each state is ahead of its five-year average. Soybean condition, not much change overall, just inching up slightly to 60% good to excellent, a one-point increase. No change in the very poor-to-poor rating, 12% in those two categories. Like corn, he says this year's soy crop is not rated as highly as last year's. This is Stephanie Ho for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. North American Free Trade Agreement negotiators have discussed food safety and animal and plant health issues as the third round of talks continue in Ottawa, Canada. Quoting Canadian Chief NAFTA negotiator Steve Verhul, we're having some constructive discussions. Officials from Canada, Mexico, and the U.S. will discuss agricultural market access issues today and tomorrow. But Verhul says he did not expect the U.S. to offer a proposal during this round for increased access to Canada's dairy market. That a natural lead-in to this week's feature for you dairy producers from the Animal Sciences and Industry Department here at K-State called Milk Lines. And standing by, as always, K-State Dairy Specialist Mike Brook. Mike? Today I want to visit with our Kansas dairy farmers concerning forage quality and robotic or automatic milking. You know, as our industry moves forward and we see more farms adopt robotic milking and also farms considering robotic milking, there's some things I think we really need to think about as we head down this road. As we move forward, we've got many choices that we have to make as we adopt this technology on our farms. One of the first choices is what type of system will you install? Will it be what we call a free flow or will it be guided? But as you think about this decision to put these robotic milkers on your farms, you're obviously going to be taking on a sizable chunk of debt. 
And in order to do that, you're going to have to probably increase milk production or, more importantly, increase milk production per cow on your farm. A lot of times that's where we kind of forget an important part about getting more milk out of an individual cow. It all comes down to what we feed, and half or more of what we feed is forage that we likely raise on our own farm. So forage quality becomes very, very important. And I know we've talked about this for decades, but as we go into robotic systems, it becomes more important. Why is that? Well, number one, in your current conventional system, you essentially force fetch cows two or three times a day. In other words, you move them to the milking parlor. After milking, they tend to move along the feed bunk and to feed. We go to an automated system or a robotic milking system, we no longer force fetch, or at least we try to avoid it if we can. In other words, the cow is making the decision to get up out of her bed and move toward the milking system. So why is she going to get up out of her bed? One of the main drivers behind that is actually hunger. So how does this relate to forage quality? Well, if we have poor quality forages, it takes those longer to digest or move through her digestive system. Therefore, her gut takes a longer time to empty. And because of that, she will remain laying till she gets that driver that's going to force her to get up and start moving toward the robotic milking system. So as we're moving down the road and as we're trying to get higher levels of milk production, as we're trying to adopt technology, and as we're trying to create an increase in milk flow that will help pay for that technology, you got to remember some of the basics. And one of the basics that's often overlooked is the forage quality on your farm. So if you're currently at 80 pounds of milk and you want to go to 90 pounds of milk, you're not going to do that with just a machine. You're going to have to change some of the things that you feed your cows. It's not going to be realized in the concentrate portion of the diet, most likely. It's going to be realized in what you do in terms of increasing the forage quality that you likely raise on your own farm. This is Mike Brook with K-State Research and Extension, encouraging our Kansas dairy farmers to consider how forage quality will impact the success of robotic milking systems. All right, Mike, many thanks. Our weekly visit with K-State Wildlife Specialist Charlie Lee is next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today returns now, and we welcome back in for his weekly visit, wildlife specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Charlie Lee. Charlie, you're going to introduce to us today the smallest mammal in Kansas, you say, the least shrew, and it's more common than folks might realize, you say. Yes, Kansas is fortunate that we have least shrews. They are very, very small. Uh, when we look at the weight of a least shrew, it's about five grams, which is about the weight of a, of a nickel. A least shrew is probably three, uh, maybe three and a half inches in length. Uh, The diameter is probably about that size of a nickel, maybe a little bit smaller. If you look very closely at the hairs on the shrew, the hairs are actually hinged. That's uh, an adaptation they have to be able to, with that small of body size, to be able to get through vegetation and cracks and crevices a, a little easier. So they have certainly have some very unique characteristics. One that, that I think people need to help them recognize it is the very large central and first incisors. They project out. Uh, these are just basically enlarged jaws, and these incisors are specialized into grasping pinchers. That's what they use to help them capture food. And I get calls from folks all over the state that say, well, they found a mole in their basement or in their home. And when we start quizzing them about what you really found, because it would be very unusual to find a mole in in the home, uh, we're usually able to determine that it is a shrew. 
Shrews are insectivores, primarily eating insects that they can capture. Sometimes they'll eat snails, earthworms, centipedes, and spiders, but a majority of their diet is is insects. Occasionally they will eat small mammals, particularly carcasses of previously killed small mammals. They take very little vegetative material, but certainly a very unique animal. Do they tunnel like moles? And we all know what sorts of headaches the mole tunneling will occur upon folks in their landscapes. Well, least through tunnels are very shallow, really just under the, the sod, and it can be separated from the soil that's just underneath it. So they do some tunneling, but it's nothing to the extent of moles. Sometimes you get several least shrews that are cooperating in building these very small tunnels. A, a tunnel for a shrew may only be two to three feet long. That may take them, you know, most of a day to get constructed. They often have two to four openings in that tunnel system. And then a nest chamber is in there as well with that nest chamber sometimes as much as eight inches in diameter. So they do some tunneling, but I've never had a, a, a complaint where People were concerned about tunneling from shrews because it is pretty minute compared to the type of tunneling and soil movement that one of their close relations, the mole, can do. You say, as a footnote, they actually conduct what you would call cooperative tunneling. Yes, you'll, you will have several of those shrews that cooperate in building tunnels, but they are somewhat territorial, and, and it's kind of unusual that they can cooperate at times to build the habitat that they need and then defend that habitat even from someone that helped them construct it in the first place. Hmm. One of the other things that's kind of really interesting about lease shrews is after they're born and within a couple of, of weeks, the female is often moving those shrews to different locations, and they practice what's called caravanning. You will have uh, the, the young follow the female by grasping uh, her tail, and then the litter mates grasp the, the tail of the one in front of them, so they're all kind of connected like a small train hmm. as they move from one location to the other. Their general range, do they occupy a fairly large area, or are they somewhat contained in that respect? No, as you would expect for an animal that's that small, they have a fairly small home range. There's not been a lot of research done on home ranges, but looking at the, the literature shows a home range would be uh, just a little over an acre. Uh, one instance was reported up to three acres, but there were a lot of reports showed that home range of under an acre. So I think we could say one acre would be the home range for a shrew, which actually, when you think about an animal that's only three inches in length and weighs just five grams, that's a lot of territory to cover. Certainly can be a lot of different obstacles in that terrain. And you said they hunt insects, preferred insects in particular, or just about anything subterranean? Just about anything, uh, and it doesn't have to be subterranean, uh, but th it's got to be fairly small. Uh, they do get a, some grasshoppers that are found, you know, on top of the ground, but most of the insects that they're going to capture are fairly small. They also have a role as being as food for other predators in the environment. They're fed on by snakes, um, fox, cats, uh, dogs. But they also have scent glands that makes them unpalatable to many cats. Hmm. And uh, oftentimes um, I hear from folks that say, well, their cat caught a mole and drug it up on the, on the front porch and, uh, but would not eat it. And again, after a little bit of discussion, it's shown that that's actually a shrew rather than a mole. So they have a place in the ecosystem. They're not a significant damage issue. You're saying that folks should simply appreciate these, and if they don't want them in the home, exclude them. I consider shrews as valuable mammals. Uh, they're very small, but they contribute to our wildlife community. They dig and they work the soil somewhat. Uh, they feed on abundant insects that we have. They aid in the decomposition of dead animals by feeding on them, and, and they serve as prey for other predators. So I think there's something that we should appreciate, and when they are found in a home, it's a good indicator that you need to take some steps to tighten up your home 
so that you're uh, not sharing your home with some of the wildlife outside. Oftentimes, um, shrews, since they're smaller, are going to be the first indication in the maintenance of your home that there there is a breach, and it's time to kind of tighten those breaches up so that we prevent uh, rodents from coming in as they're going to start doing here during the fall times. That is the story of the least shrew, again, the smallest mammal we find in Kansas. Charlie, thanks for the word on this particular critter. That's Charlie Lee. He's a wildlife specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Our time's away for today. We appreciate you being along with us. As always, please rejoin us right here tomorrow, this same time. Until then, Eric Atkinson here, bidding you a good day for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.